my name is Chris Wharton, and I'm an associate professor in the nutrition program at Arizona State University. And I'm extremely excited to have Jean-Martin Fortier here to, um, to offer this incredible workshop on profitable small-scale farming. Um, this is a, a collaboration that's been months in the making with a lot of organizations, and I want to just call some of them out now. So Kelly Young, for example, at U of A Cooperative Extension uh, helped put this on along with Steadfast Farms and Eric Schultz, um, and a number of other folks are contributing to this event. So I just want to make mention of one of the other organizations involved in this workshop. It's called the Food Systems Transformation Initiative. And so this is a new organization at ASU. It's, it's one that I direct. And it's really focused on broadly equitable participation in the food system. And that means we really care about food security and people's ability to have access to healthy, oftentimes locally produced, culturally appropriate, affordable food. But it's also about ensuring that people can have livelihoods in the food system. And so this event is really an important piece of that. We really care about having an integrated and diverse food system and allowing people to have the opportunity to be producers and participate in the food system from that perspective as well. Thing that we, first thing that we did when we bought the land was to plow it, disc it, trying to transform it as fast as possible. We removed the rocks on the farm, the small one, the big ones. We had a backhoe come in to install drainage tiles, fill in the gaps, dig a pond. We did a lot of the heavy earth moving things first with, with the backhoe and invested quite a lot of money because what we wanted to do was this, work in a permanent raised bed system which is really the backbone of our cropping system at the farm. And there is different reasons why we wanted to take this route. One of them was the land constraint. And we, we often forget this, but the tractor, just the space that it needs to turn at the end of a row, just takes up a lot of space. We're talking about 15 feet, 20 feet, 25 feet. So that was space that we couldn't afford to leave out to grass. The other reason was tractors are really made for plowing. That's why, that's why they were invented. They're, they're, they're made for that. They're good at that. Plowing, disking, uh, shaping soil, they're good at that. But if you work in a permanent bed system, you'll do this once and then you don't need to be doing that again. So we thought that's a great way to do it. And we've been cultivating only the surface of the soil ever since, the, few, the first few inches. Permanent raised beds, laid them all out, 180 of them on the farm. Everybody cool with that? Yep. I'll tell you. Okay. So since the beds are permanent, then you need to standardize things. So you need to be thinking a lot about, okay, is it going to be 30 inch? Is it going to be 40 inch? Is it going to be whatever? So we've settled that the, the beds would be 30 inch and the pathways would be 18. And you'll see different cropping systems with different standardized bed width. But really, why 18? If you look at this closely, this is pretty tight. This is the broccoli that's not even grown yet. And so we knew that we wanted to have a farm that wasn't discriminating against people with big butts. <laughs> no, really? We wanted to have enough room to be able to operate freely because harvesting on the farm is half of the work that we do. Okay? So if you're thinking about starting an organic farm, make sure that you're happy harvesting because that's half of the time you'll be spending on the farm is harvesting. And the beds are 30 inch. Why 30 inch? Well, because all of the tools that we used are standardized to that width. So, bed preparation rake, seed bed rollers, flame weeders, harrows, rotor tillers, if we'd use them, all of them are standardized to 30 inch. Why are all the beds standardized to 30 inch? All the, the tools? Because of this guy. Elliot Coleman. So Elliot Coleman wrote a book called The New Organic Grower in 89. That was the first farming book I read 
and the most influential by far. Up until recently, it was one of the better books out there. <laughs> okay? But Elliot was talking about 30-inch um, bed systems using hand tools, using a walk-behind tractor. And he had been developing tools with the Johnny's company. They, I've been told that there's, their catalog is here. Developing tools with them that were appropriately scaled for small-scale farming or market gardening. So he's had been pushing this 30-inch bed system for quite a while, and we picked up on that. And now, as more and more people adopt these 30-inch, it's really becoming a standard throughout the US and even in Europe. There's also a lot of good reasons why you, would ha you want to have smaller beds, more compact. One of them, and it seems not, not a lot, so you can jump easily over them. Okay? So in a permanent bed setup, you want to avoid compaction at all costs. That's the reason for doing this. So you don't want to be stepping in your beds. And so the fact that you can hop over them makes it easy. You're not losing time going all the way to the end and coming back if you need to go and you know, pick up sandbags, per se. Okay, that's one example. Also, when you're harvesting in a crouching position, you're not hyperextending to reach the middle of the bed. Okay? That might not seem like something that is big, but if you're spending you know, 40 years harvesting greens, it's going to make a difference, even you know, five or six years. This is human scale. This is made for ergonomic postures to be able to work out. And it makes a big, big difference. Okay, I've been harvesting greens for a long time. And, you know, I know that some people start their day with yoga and they ended up with yoga. I drink beer at night. So I want to have good posture while I work. Makes a big difference. Okay? Is everybody cool with that? Again, I don't want to be convincing. I'm just, I just want to convey that these are the things that we've done and try and explain why they're important and why they work. The other thing that we rapidly evolved with was the walk-behind tractor or two-wheel tractor from the BCS company. And before owning one, I had never seen one before. I had, you know, YouTube wasn't around back then. And that was the best move we ever made because these machines are tailor-made to work on 30-inch bed systems. I'll talk more about them later on, but really this is a machine that is versatile, rugged, and it's gonna last a lifetime for heavy-duty service. We, want, we knew we wanted to work with a harrow. I'll talk about the harrow later on. A flail mower. These are two, two of the most important tools in our toolbox. And when we were looking for these on a small compact tractor, it was about five or six times the price than to buy them new for a small walk-behind tractor. So these are priced, I should change this because that was in 2004. Prices have gone up a little bit, but not that much. So there you go, you have a tractor to do the soil work for you know, a fraction of the cost, important stuff. We also built the nursery really rapidly the first spring, set up the hoop house because we wanted to extend the season with salad mix, and we wanted to grow tomatoes inside in the summer because, you know, moisture, rain is where, is where the dew forms in the green outside, and that all, all of the fungi problem come out of that. So we wanted to have shelter for the, for the nightshades. So that was all done in the first spring. Really, we just bought the land in the fall. We spent the winter planning for the design of the farm. And then the next spring, boom, we're setting that up and going. We standardized the width of the bed, but also the length of the bed. Okay? And this is a pretty practical trick here because what it does is that all the row covers, the drip irritation, all of the sprinkler lines, they're all standardized to 100 foot. So you need less of them, and you're not fooling around looking for the row cover of the right size. That's a lot of time wasted there. So you standardized, and there you go. All of your equipment 
is more versatile, you need less of them. And by doing so, what happened is that the bed became a unit of measure on the farm. So instead of calculating yields per acres, which yields per acre on the fact that you're growing one acre and you're growing 40 different vegetables doesn't compute at all. But now we've, we've known from you now there's like 200 lettuce heads in one bed. You need to have four or five wheelbarrows of compost if you're going to have an equivalent of 40 tons per acre. So we've brought all of the number crunching down to one bed. And it really simplified a lot of the production aspects of the farm, which I'll talk later on. Okay? So the question was asked, did you make the beds? How did that go? So the first thing that we did was make a map of the farm. And I'm so lucky that we did this beforehand because a lot of good came out of that. I was reading some permaculture books back then. You know, Bill Mollison has Fat Bible Number One, and Fat Bible Number Two, these big book. And you would open these books and you would always see the farms laid out in a map-like fashion that way. And they would talk about zones. So the zones that you visit more frequently need to be closer to your house. And the zone that needs to be visited less often, you know, for animals, the woodlot, whatever, should be further out. Because the whole design is to limit your foot dispersion on the farm. Your traffic patterns need to be at the shortest cycle possible because that's where we lose a lot of time on the farm. Just moving around, moving around. So you want to have, you know, the shortest patterns possible. So by doing it that way, we saw what we had and we designed the farm so that all of our beds would be grouped together in 10 field blocks. So managing 10 field blocks is a lot easier than managing 180 uh, beds. And all the field blocks have 16 beds, all 100 feet long. And they're all surrounding the warehouse where the vegetables are brought back to the farm. So wherever we are in the gardens, we're never far away, which has been saving us hundreds, hundreds of hours every year, ever since we've had that farm design. We also had a, a map for two compost piles because we wanted to be close. We wanted to be close. We had a water line that was planned to go all around each field blocks so every, everywhere it could be uh, watered. So all of this was laid out on paper and then when it made a lot of sense, then we went and just dig the first beds. Okay? Why 10 field blocks? Okay? One of the reasons is that because we wanted to have a crop rotation on the farm. And crop rotation is a good practice that needs to be revisited. You know, my neighbors, they grow corn fields and their rotation is like 10 years corn, one year soya. And it's just like, that's not good for the soil. We need to come back to more complexity into integrating different botanical families between themselves. The reason why you want to do this is to limit the insect pressures from one year to the other. You want to have the roots of certain crops prospecting at different depth so that you're not mining the soil with its mineral always at the same depth. There's a lot of great reasons why you would want to have a lot of diversity but the question is, how do you get to manage all of that? Because, you know, it's not, it's not easy. So what we did is we did all of our homework. We looked at all of the botanical families, the numbers of years that we should have between one another. And then we wanted to have the root crops, the short-term root crops like radishes, turnips, carrots, and beets in successions in the same beds per year as with short-season lettuces. So we built one botanical family for these guys. And we knew we were going to be growing a lot of these. So we had a setup where you have one of these family every two block. And then we went out and said, OK, the brassica seeds, you need four years between them. So four years like that, four years like that. And we made all these things on a piece of paper 
actually working with cards, okay, trying to figure the right sequence. And in the end, to get what we wanted to achieve, we needed to have 10 field blocks to make it work. 10 field blocks, so the rotation is over 10 years. And that's why we have 10 field blocks on the farm. Because it mimics the, rot the rotation that we had designed on paper. And so this is one botanical family. Next year it's going to go there. What's there is going to go there. And so on. So it's counterclockwise. And why this story is important is because we've took on a challenge of designing a crop rotation that is very complex. And we've designed it in a way that is very simple to follow. And the farm is laid out with that in mind. Because when you're farming on small acreage, if you want to do this for a long time, you need to take care of the soil. You don't have the luxury to just put it on fallow for a year or two and come back to it. This is intensively managed and the crop rotation needs to be taken into account from the start, from the get-go. Lots of questions. Okay. Okay, my suggestion is this one. You should standardize the width of your beds. Okay? You should group them together in field blocks. Doesn't matter if they're 30 feet, 50 feet, 60 feet. If they're 150 feet, mind you, you need to be three people to move the drip tapes. Okay? So that's something to think about. So every time you need to move drip tapes, if your beds are like 200 feet, you need to have a crew of at least three people. So that's something to think about. Then, you should be looking at field blocks as botanical families because it's so much easier than to manage individual beds. And then you should look at the right patterns and trying to figure out how that could work in, in your farming design. So you don't need to mimic exactly this uh, because that was kind of like, that was also the space that we kind of had. So it could be different on a different farm. But that's something to think about. And the other thing, the advice I can give is that when you're starting out, the first three years, forget crop, for crop rotation altogether. Just plant anything anywhere. First three, perhaps? What would be the reason for so is that when you're starting, you don't know where you'll be in three years. You're evolving your markets, you're developing your clientele, everything's moving, you're figuring you'll be growing a lot of carrots, but then you figure out that the chefs, they want more of that instead. So you're figuring things out. And if you spend a month or two making that really slick design for a crop rotation, and then in two years, you don't follow it anymore, there, that, what's the purpose of that? So you're better off to withhold and make sure that you kind of know where you're going and then you can implement a rotation. Okay, because, there, because you'll see later on, the way we've set things up makes it really easy for us to operate, but there's a major constraint with this way of doing things. For example, if you look at our rotation, we only have one field block of nightshades. So that means 16 beds. That excludes the greenhouse, but outside crops. So 16 beds, that's all we have. If I want to cheat and I want to have 18, I'll put them here, then I'm not respecting my rotation. So it's a big constraint. And we'll talk about that later on. Yes? Yep. That is one parameter that you want to have. The other one would be the amount of time that the crops are in the field. Is it 40 days, 50 days, 60 days? Because that's going to make a difference. Uh, botanical families, you know, they're susceptible to the same insect pressures. 
So you have all these parameters that you laid out, and then it's up to you to figure out, okay, what works? So you can, you can base your first experience on that, because that works, like what we've done on our farm, but it's a valuable um, project to look at all these elements and research some of that yourself. Yes? No, no, it's all thought about. Yeah. Well, because the reason is we came up with this after doing our research. You guys are in a different climate. Perhaps I think it's a valuable, um, it's worthwhile thinking about. But you can influence yourself by this. I try to avoid people just copying because I think the thinking process is also important to learn about crop rotation. And you know, this is what we came up with, but another system could also work out. But this is good enough. But again, it has some serious constraint. We'll see later on, and a lot of growers are like, oh, JM, the way you've done things is, is too, there's too many constraints. I can't work in that kind of setup. But most of these growers, they don't have the land constraint that I have, trying to intensify production over 20, 30 years. Okay, so that, that's something to keep in mind. Yes? We'll talk about cover crops because, yes, there's cover crops in the rotation in another design. They're once every three, three years, the, 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 the field blocks are in a cover crop for half of the year. So they've been built into the, the cropping system. Yes? Okay, so that was the question that I'm getting at, okay? On our farm, and when you're working in a permanent bed setup, the layout of the beds should be done to allow excess water runoff to be channeled away from the growing area. Eric was telling me that it's not unusual to have two inch of rain fall in one shot, okay? What happens if you have raised beds that are, you know, let's say you have a slope and you, you put your beds counter slope. The water is going to pour, it's going to mount in the, in the aisles, and then it's going to wash over the top of the bed like that, cascading down, bringing all of your topsoil with it. Okay? In an intensive, in a biologically intensive cropping system, like the one that we have on our farm, the, the fertility is all about the first few inches. That's what we're building. So you want to make sure that you're not creating a design pattern where all of your investment goes washed down the drain. So your beds, our beds, are always sloped to allow runoff water to be channeled away. Yeah, because, because the, bay, the beds are raised. If we look, if I come back here, So the beds are raised, and so all the water will go here, and then it's channeled away. Okay? You're better to do this and, at worst, recuperate the water and put it back onto the beds than to have a design where everything is flat, and if there's two inch of water, you just lose everything. So this being said, I've never really, I've, I've grown in New Mexico, so it's kind of the same. And that's how we set it up also. Okay, so the take-home message is that before we dug our first bed, we had a design laid out on a piece of paper, and everything was figured out, and then we built the farm. Okay? That's, that's the most important thing, my most important message for you guys that are starting Take time to plan it on paper first, even if you don't own the land, even if the dream of having a farm or a market garden is a few years ahead, take the time to draw it. Why not? 
Think it through where things go. Okay, here you'll see that the tool shed where all the tools are, it's all in the middle. You know, the bathroom is in the middle. Everything is centralized. And in others, you know, and that's, that's, that's pretty the, the, the best you could have. But in a different setup, perhaps the building would be here. And then you would need to think, okay, the building is here. Should I move it? Should I tear it down and build another one? Or should I have different stations, built little you know, tool sheds here and there? You need to be thinking about this because once you're farming in the heat of the summer or in the heat of your winter, <laughs> and I'm, I'm confused with all of this, you know, you don't have time. So you create a design and then you work in it. But that designing stage is so important because it's going to make a difference between working you know, 70 hours or 50 hours. Because if you're losing time circulating all over the farm, you're wasting a lot of time. Okay? Good? Moving on. So this is a picture of the rabbit farm. It's called La Lapinière. And, you know, now it's a pretty nice home. So just to say that these buildings, they're out there, and we can, we can uh, take, take them back. <laughs>